Well, good morning, church. How are you guys? Doing pretty good. You know, I was just being a regular attender here and everything. I was a little bummed that I couldn't win $50. So if anybody wants to donate to the Austin Weaver Feel Sorry For Me funds, I'd gladly take your money um, and, and, or gift cards or whatever it might be. Hey, before we get uh, started in our text this morning, um, I just want to settle something, and I need your help to settle this very important issue. This morning, with your help, we are going to discover who is the best football team in the state of Iowa, okay? Here we go. Drake University. All right. I think there's a lot of confused faces. Yes, Drake has a football team, okay? Yes, they do. How about the UNI Panthers? How many Panthers? Come on, give me a roar. All right, all right. That's okay. All right, how about the Iowa State Cyclones? All right, that was, that was, that was pretty good. All right, any Hawkeye fans in the place? Oh man, I, early service I couldn't tell, but I think the Hawks got it in this service. So let it be known that on uh, September 2nd at 11.07, the Hawkeyes are officially, no, I'm just teasing. They're a great team. It is, it's um, uh, gonna be a great day today. Um, and you know why it's gonna be a great day is because I get to wear God's favorite team's jersey. Uh, being the Yankees. Yes, this is a Yankees jersey. It has a patch. This is an all-star jersey of the Yankees of Aaron Judge, my man. Um, it's a great day because I've got my Baylor socks on. I'm representing Baylor University. We beat a junior high girls team yesterday, and I am so excited that we won. It was fantastic. It's a great day because I've got my lucky underwear on, and, and actually, that's a joke. I don't wear underwear, so I'm just... <laughs> Just teasing. Okay, it's a joke. Okay. Sorry for all you visual people. <laughs> it's horrible. It's a great day because we had awesome worship. We had a donut wall. How many got a donut? This, oh man, I had like a couple holes and I'm just kind of a little bit on a jittery sugar rush right now. We've got hot dogs that are going to be grilled up. And, and, and it's an awesome day to be together. But the, the main reason why today is an awesome day is because Jesus Christ has done everything to be in a relationship with you. And there's nowhere that you can go that would escape his love. It doesn't matter what you've done in your past. He's concerned with the right now. He's concerned with your future. And there's forgiveness for you. And this morning, he's inviting you to be on his team. I am so thankful that I get to gather every week with my spiritual family, with this team, with this, with this group and this community of believers. And, and I've seen that when we come together and when we pull our resources together, when, when we come together and, 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 and we, we bring our uniqueness and our talents and our gifts together, we can accomplish amazing things. <laughs> Some of you guys don't even know what just hit you. <laughs> just embrace the awesomeness. Just embrace it. In case you aren't familiar with um, that, that song, that's, that's a, a little short clip from the 2006 Disney movie, High School Musical. And after being uh, mistaken for Zac Efron in recent years, I decided <laughs> to... Um, I, d I decided to assume the role and, and play him. So, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that a lot of you guys were distracted by our phenomenal um, dancing, and you're thinking, what, what does this have to do with anything? I promise this has a point. But in case you were distracted by the dancing, I want to read you a little bit of the lyrics from this timeless hit. It says this, here and now, yes, it's timeless hit. Here and now, it's time for celebration. I finally figured out that all our dreams have no limitations. That's what it's all about. Everyone is special in their own way. We make each other strong. We're not the same. We're different in a good way. Together's where we belong. We're all in this together, and it shows when we stand hand in hand, make our dreams come true. There's quite a bit of truth in that song. And I think that in our text today, in, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul understood that we are better together. That when we come in together as a team, as one unit, as one family, we can accomplish 
anything. And I've titled my, my sermon, The Dream Team, this morning. Now, I said dream team, and I'm sure a lot of you people that were alive in the 90s instantly thought of the 1992 dream team. How many are with me with that? How many went that way? You've got Jordan Michael Jordan, you've got Scottie Pippen, you had Larry Bird, you had Charles Barkley, you had Stockton and Malone, Ewing and Magic Johnson. I mean, that team was the dream team, right? But let me just tell you this morning that there is a team that's more dominant than that team. This team has been around for thousands of years and it'll be around for eternity to come. This team has the potential to end world hunger. This team has the potential to end human trafficking, to end abuse, to end wars. And the great news is that God is inviting you to be on that team this morning. And like I said earlier, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your past. What matters is right here, right now, in this moment, whether or not you're willing to join this team and be all in so that we can accomplish great things. Philippians chapter 2 is where our text is. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. I'd encourage you to follow along in your personal Bibles, which hopefully you brought, and if not, we can loan you some giant ones on the screens to my right or to my left. Let's read. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Heavenly Father, we ask you this morning to speak to our hearts, that you would open up our minds, you'd open up our ears, you'd open up our spirits to what you have for us, God. I pray that you'd anoint this message, that you would uh, speak and flow through me exactly what you want, Lord, and I pray that there um, would just be clarity this morning in, in, in um, this message in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Now, one of the first things that Paul says in this text and to this body of believers is to be like-minded, to be one in spirit and in purpose. And in order for the dream team to be successful, we all need to be one in spirit and purpose. In verses 1 and 2, Paul is not questioning whether the Philippians have these things. He is using a rhetorical expression to say that since the believers do in fact have these things, they should complete his joy by demonstrating unity. If believers cannot live in unity, the transformative power of the gospel comes into question. As a result, the gospel may lose credibility among unbelievers. There is so much divisiveness in today's society and today this world. All you have to do is turn on the TV and any news, no matter what news it is, and you see just people that are just being divided. And God has called his church to be unified. If we as a body of believers cannot come together and be unified, then, then we're just as, as anything else. We need to be unified in purpose and in spirit. But this is impossible to do in our own strength. We need something or someone to unify us, to bring us together. And that person is Jesus Christ. He is the bonding agent that brings us together and makes us one. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're white or you're black or you're brown. It doesn't matter if you're educated or uneducated. It doesn't matter if you're an athlete or musician. It doesn't matter if you're an American or an immigrant. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. It doesn't matter if you're young or you are old. It doesn't matter if you are pretty or you are ugly. It doesn't matter if you're pretty ugly, okay? God 
takes our differences and he makes us one in spirit and in love. And then he gives us this one purpose, this one goal. What is that purpose? What is that goal? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says that, that God's will is that all people be saved. John 3, 16 says, whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now, now last time I checked, the words all and whoever are inclusive words. Hear me. In Jesus' life and his death, his main purpose was to bring people into the kingdom of God. A lot of you are searching for purpose in life, and, and there's people who spend their entire lifetime trying to figure out what is my purpose on this place called earth. Can I just tell you this morning, it's not to make a lot of money and, and, and to live a comfortable life. Can I tell you this morning, it's not to raise successful children. Can I tell you that your purpose is, is not to be well-liked and accomplished? Your purpose is the same as Jesus Christ. It's, it's to be heavenly-minded. It's to, to bring people into the kingdom of heaven. New Hope's vision statement is one word. It's heaven. That's what we're looking at. That's where we're headed. That's our vision. That's where our life ought to be headed towards. Our mission statement is very simple. It's to go to heaven and to bring as many people with us as we possibly can. That Jesus' last words before he ascended into heaven was what? Therefore, go and make disciples of all people of all nations. We need to have an eternal perspective of the people that are in our lives. Now let me ask you a very challenging question. Are you concerned? Are you legitimately? Are you for real? Are you actually concerned with the eternal destination of the people that are in your life? Of your coworkers, of your friends, of, of your family members? The way you spend your time, your energy, and your money will tell you what you really care about. And, and maybe you've, you've heard uh, one of the pastors talk about the everybody principle. You know, if, and that's simply this. If, if everybody loved the way that I loved, would this church be loving? If everybody served the way that I served, would anything ever get done? If everyone gave the way that I gave, would there be missions dollars in the bank account? If, if everybody shared their faith the way that I shared my faith, would there be new people coming to know the love of Jesus Christ? If, if everyone forgave the way that I forgave, would this church be a forgiving church? See, New Hope is a, a wonderful place, and last year, because of your unity, we gave over $800,000 to missions. And Pastor Brian was telling you about those seven water wells that part of that money went towards in Tanzania where we brought clean water to seven different villages that previously had no access to it. Last year we gave over $60,000 out in benevolence and that's all because we gathered under one purpose and one love and we came together and we did something great. If you're not already a part of the dream team of, of missions giving, I encourage you, jump on board. Let's do something together. There are bellies to be filled and hungry souls to be fed. There are wells to be dug and people to be reached. Together, we can accomplish so much more than we can apart but we'll never accomplish those things if we aren't first unified in spirit and in purpose. And in order to do that, we must die to our selfish natures. Verses three and four says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, look to others' needs and interests. Now, some of the first words that you learn in the English or any language um, as, as a, a child is what? Mine. How many have seen Finding Nemo? You got the seagulls, mine, mine, mine. Turn to your neighbor and just say, mine, mine, mine. All right, mine. It takes zero energy and effort to think about ourselves, but it takes a lot of, of energy and effort to think about the greater good. And one of the things that makes New Hope so beautiful is that this church is a multi-generational church. There are families here this morning in fact, after the first service, some lady stopped me and said, um, said this and proved my point, that have four generations worshiping under the same roof. Great-grandparents all the way down to great-grandchildren. 
This, and as soon as we realize that church isn't about us, church becomes so much more to us. Young person, church isn't all about you. Seasoned persons, church isn't all about you. In order to reach all people, there might be things that you don't fully like about the church style. And I understand that this church isn't all about me. It's about God and reaching all people. In, in a worship set, I might not like all the songs that we sing. My top fa- five favorite worship songs are different than my dad's top five favorite songs, which is different than Grandma Georgine's top five favorite worship songs. But I see the value, and I want to worship with my dad, and I want to worship with Grandma Georgine. Anybody hear me this morning? Look, I understand that, that you want your favorite preacher to preach every Sunday, but I can't do that. I'm just exhausted, okay? But really, when, when, your, when your least favorite preacher comes up to bat, guess what? He might be someone else's favorite preacher, and it might not minister to you the way that you like being talked to and you enjoy it, but it's ministering to someone else, and we need to prefer others in love. Romans chapter 12, Paul, the same author of this letter, says this, to prefer one another in love. And I think that this church does a pretty good job at that. But I want to challenge you that if you start to get a complaining spirit, and I know complaining is not a word because Google documents told me over and over that complaining is not a word. But if you get a complaining spirit, stop and ask yourself, does what I'm complaining about Does it affect just me, or does it affect the entire body? In order to stay unified, we need to die to our selfish desires. This church, this isn't, this sermon isn't just about um, style preferences and church style preferences. This includes setting aside personal goals and ambitions. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have personal goals and ambitions because those are important, so listen very closely to what I am saying. Imagine with me for a minute that there is a car, and in this car there are three different sets of steering wheels, and there's three different sets of pedals. And in order for this car to go anywhere, all of the steering wheels and the pedals have to be in sync. Okay, not the bands, but in in harmony. You know, we have to turn left and we have to brake at the same time and and give gas at the same time. And Pastor Zach and Pastor Luke and myself, we decide we're going to get in this car and we're going to head to my house, which is in Grimes. Okay, the first thing that we would do when we get in this car is we'd put on our seatbelts because safety's first. The second thing that we would do when we get in the car is we would have to figure out which route we're going to take to get to Grimes. We could take Meredith all the way down to 128th Street and head north on 128th. We could take the interstate around to 141 and head to Grimes that way. We could go down Northwest, or I mean uh, 86th Street and then head to Northwest 70th Street and get to Grimes that way. And there's, there's about five or six different ways and variations that you could get to my house from here. Now I think that it's best to go on the interstate and go down 141 as long as it's not like 4.30 in the afternoon, right? Pastor Luke, he gets lost easily, and so he wants the most simple thing. He struggles, let's just be honest, okay? <laughs> he, he wants the easiest route, which is just 86 to 128, and that turns into James Street into Grimes. And so he's, he's all about that. And Pastor Zach, he loves traffic circles. He loves roundabouts. He loves going around them over and over again. He just can't get enough of them, okay? Now, that means, and and keep in mind that that this car will not go unless we are all in unity. That means that unless Pastor Zach and myself decide to give up our personal way to benefit Luke, we would never get to our destination. Our selfishness needs to die. And in this imaginative illustration, the car represents the church, and each and every single one of you have a steering wheel and you have a set of pedals. Now keep in mind, the goal, the destination was never in question. We were all in. We're like, yeah, I want to go to Austin's house because he's got a, a, a cool house, right? Or maybe, I don't know, okay? We're, we're, going, we're going to Grimes. You know, the, the destination never changed. But what did change and what the variable was is the route in which we got to my house. Ask God this morning, 
do I have selfishness in my life that is preventing the greater good from happening? And now this doesn't apply just to church, this applies to marriage. Oh, I'm stepping on my toes here, ouch. Right? I realized that when I got married and I started having kids, one, uh, your time gets cut in half, then you have a kid, it gets cut in half, then you have another kid, it gets cut in half again, then you have another kid, it gets cut in half again, and now you've got no time. I just realized how selfish I can be in my nature, and marriage exposed that. I realized, like, I'm, I'm an introvert, and I know that you guys would never think that I'm an introvert because of the way I'm talking right now and the, the dancing and everything else, but like, a great time sounds to me is, is 12 hours in a bow stand, sitting all day, not talking to anybody or anything, just me and myself in the woods. That sounds phenomenal. And, and I realized that when I got married, some of, and I'm still realizing this and I'm still learning this lesson, that, that some of my selfish desires and the things that I want and that I, I need are gonna have to be put on the back burner for a little bit. Because it's unfair to my wife if I just prefer myself in love and, and, and recharge. Because guess what? She's been breastfeeding for the last three and a half years, and she never gets a break from her kids. It's unfair for me to go um, and, and take all this time off. And some of you guys are just plain just being selfish in your marriage. And, and not just in, in the way you, time, you know, share time and, and different things like that, but also just in your goals and, and, and your aspirations. Uh, was that the right word? Yeah, just making sure. Uh, you, you know, if, if you are not unified in one spirit, in one mind, your marriage is going to really, really struggle. You can't have one person that their eyes are on God and they're constantly pursuing God and the other person has their own goals and their own visions and their own dreams where they're pursuing their career or they're pursuing a higher standard of living or they're pursuing something else. You can't have one person in a marriage that's all about travel ball or travel dancer or, or whatever it is or, or their kids and, and they're pursuing that and the other pursuing Christ because they're not growing together. The the, the focal point, the, the unity is in Jesus Christ, and as you and your spouse begin to put Jesus Christ as the middle of, of your, and your uh, marriage and your relationship, you will not just grow closer to Christ, but you're going to grow closer together as you do that. Man, God wants you to have an incredible marriage. And, and if you pursue him, he's going to give that to you. I firmly believe this, that if you are fully pursuing Christ, and it takes a commitment on both ends, on both ends, but when both people are fully pursuing Christ, I don't believe that divorce will ever happen. Because God wants your marriage to be better than movies marriages. He wants it to be happy. He wants it to be full of adventure. He wants it to be romantic and passionate and fun. He wants your marriage to be absolutely amazing. And that's only going to happen when we pursue Christ with everything in our hearts, where there's that commonality where he brings us together, he bonds us together. And maybe along the way, as you pursue Christ, he's going to sand and polish some areas in your life. You know, he will give you the power to forgive your spouse. You know that he'll give you the love in your heart to love them through whatever it is that they're going through. Did you know that he'll open up your eyes so that you can see the hurt that has happened in their life and maybe there's understanding that begins to take place where it's not just, well, you know, God wants you to have an incredible marriage and it starts with both of your commitments of, of saying, God, you're first. You are number one in my life. I'm gonna pray with my spouse together. I'm gonna, I'm gonna worship with her together and, and, and it's, it's absolutely possible. Parents, we have to be so careful that we don't just cater to our kids every whimper. If, if we act as if the universe revolves around our kids, they're going to grow up thinking that. Their selfish nature is, is going to kick in, and they're going to say, yeah, everything is about me. Yeah, church is about me. Yeah, this is about me. Yes, that is about me. 
If we make the kids the center of our universe, we're teaching them to not make God the center of their universe. But we can't feed this, this selfish nature. I get it. I'm a parent of three, and I look at my kids, and there's some days where I just want to quit my job and, and just live on, on bread and water and just spend every waking minute with my kids. Because I understand that last night when I tried to sleep through that horrible storm and, you know, getting up at 5 a.m., and I'm trying to sleep, I understood that my baby girl, Essie, has grown, and, and I'll never have yesterday back. I understand how quick time goes. And, and there's this part of me where I just want to invest everything that I can into my kids and just forsake everything else. But I realize that I would do them a terrible disservice if that was what I decided to do. To maintain unity so that the dream team wins, we not only need to die to our selfish desires, but we also need to have an all-in mentality. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm all in. Come on, turn to your other neighbor and say, I'm all in. Oh, she's got a shirt. She's all in. Wow, that's awesome. Wow. I, I, she's all in. She's really literally all in. That's, that's, that's awesome and out of left field. It's fantastic, okay? When, when Jesus, we see this in Jesus' life, okay? When Jesus set aside his deity and he left heaven, he stepped out of deity and he stepped down onto earth. And he, the Bible says that he took on flesh. He took humanity upon himself. In that moment, Jesus was all in. And in everything he said and everything that he did while he was on this earth, he was all in. Colossians 3.23 says that whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as for working for the Lord, not for humans. Work at it with all of your heart. Now this is a little sidetrack. This isn't in my note notes at all, but um, if you are, consider yourself a Christian and you're an employee, you better be the best employee that you possibly can be, because you're not working for an earthly boss, you're working for God. You should be the most honest, you should be clocking in a minute early and a minute late, you shouldn't be looking to take shortcuts in, in your line of work, you should be the best employee, the best boss, the best coworker that anybody has ever seen, because Why? Not so that people can say, oh, that guy's awesome. Oh, man, he's fantastic. Oh, he's a really good guy. No, it's because the way you work reflects people's view of Jesus Christ. The, the name on the back of my jersey that I wear every day is not Aaron Judge. It's not Austin Weaver. It's Jesus Christ. And we need to remember who we're playing for. Now, earlier, I blew your minds with my amazing dance moves. And you guys want to know where I learned to dance? Show choir, right? Show choir. Any show choirs in here? All right, so um, a little backstory to help you understand how I joined show choir, okay? I'm a, a sophomore, and we are in Orlando, Florida. It's March, spring break, and the Urbandale Show Choir group would, would travel there and compete at Epcot um, just outside the American Pavilion. Now, Mr. Wooden, are you here today, Mr. Wooden? Yeah, Mr. Wooden. Hey, um, he was, he was my director, and, and my dad and him were standing outside the American Pavilion, kind of towards the back of the platform, and, and uh, they're saying, what can we do to get you to join show choir? And I'm like, no way. I'm not doing it. Like, I don't dance. You know, I, I was six foot four. I had long, curly hair. I would have looked like a Q-tip standing in a stack of toothpicks, okay? I just, just looked goofy, awkward, you name it. It's just like, Puberty happened, but not really. It was just bad, okay? And, and I, I just feel so exposed. I'm 6'4", everybody else is 5'1". It's just, it was just awkward. And I was like, not happening. I'm not signing up for show choir. And my dad made this mistake. He says, what would it take for you to join show choir, Austin? I said, without hesitation, I said, a hunting trip to Africa and Namibia. I want to go on a safari hunting trip, and I want to hunt in Africa. Is that a true story, Mr. Wooden? Right there, he's nodding his head, just like he used to when I got in trouble, kind of in <laughs> choir, okay? I, I shook my dad's hand, I looked at Mr. Wooden in the eye, I said, you remember this because I am getting this trip. And, and that, that trip actually did happen in, in 2015 or 2016, June, I can't remember, um, and it was, it was an amazing time. Uh, I didn't really have to go, this is another side note, um, but while we're there, we'll, we'll go there. Um, I didn't really have to go to Mr. Wooden and say, 
you need to remember this and you need to hold my dad to it because my dad never made me a promise my entire life that he didn't fulfill. He always under-promised and over-delivered. And because of that, I have a proper understanding of how God's promises work in my life. When God promises and speaks things over my life, I have no problem understanding and saying, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So we make this agreement, March, sophomore, August rolls around and things get real. Let me tell you, we start singing, we start dancing, and I learned this valuable lesson about being all in in show choir because when we first started, I was kind of like, you know, and you could kind of see it in my attitude and my face and my fingers weren't crisp or whatever it was that we did, you know, and, and I just wasn't all in, but I, I realized that I'm on a team of 50 people and the other 49 people are all in. They were 100% bought in. Their expressions were there, their hands and their crisp movements, and they were all in. And I realized, man, if I don't become all in, I'm gonna be the odd one out. I'm gonna look like a doofus up there if I don't become all in. And it took me several months of practicing and sticking with it to become comfortable so that I could be all in. It didn't come natural by any means. But by the time the performance rolled around in, in January and February, I was all in. And maybe that's you this morning. You've been trying on this church thing. You've been coming to church. Maybe this is the first time you're in church and you're like, why are people raising their hands? Why are people laughing? Why do people come forward? Why, why, is, why is he dancing? I mean, what's going on? You know, and, and church just kind of feels uncomfortable. Can I just encourage you to stick with it? The longer you stick with it, the more you'll understand of God's heart and the way he sees you and the things that he has in store for you and that it'll become natural and it won't be awkward anymore. Just stick with it. If I would have never fully bought into what the group was trying to accomplish, I would have cost the team points in scoring. Hear me, my lack of commitment would have affected the team. God's desire this morning for you is to be 100% fully bought in. You are all in. Can you imagine with me the things that we could do if all of us were all in? I, I, I got to thinking about this week and, and I just, I couldn't help but get excited because I see the potential. I see the, the potential when people are fully bought in, when they're saying, I'm all in. I'm not, I'm not Wednesday and, and Sunday and I'm, I'm every day of the weekend. I am all in. Can you imagine what this church would be able to do? Can you imagine the help that we'd be able to provide? We'd be able to help immigrants. We'd be be able to help the hurting. We'd be able to help the homeless. We'd be able to help the, 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 the hungry. Come on, somebody. We'd be able to father the fatherless. We'd be able to, to minister to the, the widows. We'd be able to provide hope to those that feel lost and, and minister to the hurting and the broken. And I can see it and it excites me so much. But it all hinges on whether or not we're all in. See, Jesus didn't call us to love Americans. He called us to love all people. Jesus didn't call us to love people that we deem worthy of love. He called us to love all people. Can I just tell you this morning, flat out, right here, right now, that if you don't love all people, you're not all in. We do not have the right to choose what we're all in and what we're all about. And if, if there's people that you struggle with loving, then you better ask God to give you his heart. And when you do that, you better be ready because he might just place his heart in there and he might call you to the group of people that you don't like the most because God loves all people. We don't get to pick and choose what we're all in about or not, which brings me to my, the second thing that Paul calls us to, and that's to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ did. What is that attitude? Take a look at verses five through eight with me. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset 
as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used in his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus understood that he was sent to earth on purpose for a purpose. And there was nothing that was going to get in his way of him fulfilling what the Father, God the Father, had sent him to do. And it's so important that we understand, and this is clear this morning, that you cannot be fully obedient unless you are full of the Holy Spirit, where God comes inside you and he helps you become obedient. You will feel completely overwhelmed and exhausted from trying to muster up enough strength to obey God in your own power. You see, right before Jesus enters into his most difficult test of obedience, where, where he's about ready to be handed over to the betrayer and, and he's gonna die a horrible cross, uh, death on a cross and be hung on a tree, which was a sign of, of disgrace in the Jewish culture. Deuteronomy says that, being hung on a pole. The most disrespectful way to die. And what does Jesus do? He goes and he secludes himself early in the morning. That morning is probably in the middle of the night. And, and, and he spends time in prayer. And he asks God, his Father, to give him help. He says, if there's any other way that we can do this, God, please, but not my will, your will be done. I need your strength. I need your spirit. I need your help to enable me to obey what you have called me to do. Hear me this morning very clearly. Obeying the law apart from a relationship with Christ is religion at its finest. It will leave you feeling defeated, discouraged, and depressed. And God wants to be in a relationship with you so that he will fill you and he will equip you to do the great things that he has in store for you. Listen, relationships are, are really pretty simple. Like my relationship with my wife I don't just wake up on Wednesdays and Sundays and talk to her. Every morning, I wake up, got my nasty dog breath on, lean over, and I talk to her. She usually does more talking to me than, than I do to her. It's probably just a gender thing or something like that. But we're in communication every single day. And, and I think that there might be many people this morning that have become so overwhelmed with the sense of responsibility of doing things for Christ, and you've been trying to do them apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're feeling discouraged and depressed. You're, you're feeling overwhelmed because you're operating in your own strength, not in the strength from abiding and being in the presence of God. If you just simply ask God to give you the help that you need, he's going to give it to you. You know why? because he's a team player and, and he wants us to rise up as this dream team, as this amazing, unstoppable, living organism that spans from, from every ethnic group to every continent to, to everywhere in the world that's unstoppable. He wants you to be a part of that and he's going to fill you with the power to be able to obey. Would you all bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Put away your notes, put away anything that distracts you. You know, I used to wonder when I was a kid, why do we close our eyes during prayer? Is there something like magical about that? No, there's, there's nothing magical, but closing your eyes just simply is, is a, a way of eliminating distractions, you know? You don't want to be looking at the greasy hair in front of you or the lice that's in front of you or anything else. You know, sorry for those that had to peek and make sure that wasn't the case. But as you close your eyes, as we focus this morning, we put away distractions. I believe that God is speaking here in this moment and he's speaking to everyone. And maybe you feel like you've never heard God's voice in your life. You've never um, heard him or, or felt him. I believe that this morning you are going to hear from God. It's going to be clear. He's going to move in your heart and in your conscience. He's gonna speak clearly to you for the very first time. And God loves you. 
He loves you so much. He wants to forgive you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He doesn't want to punish you. He wants to bless you. With every eye closed and head bowed, I want to give the opportunity for anyone here that has not joined the dream team, but you want to. You, you, you need forgiveness. You realize that I've lived this life apart from Jesus Christ, and I'm ready to step into a, a relationship that's every day um, I'm, and every moment. I'm going to live for him. I no longer am I going to live in my selfish nature, but I'm going to make God's uh, unity and, and his purpose and his plan. That's, that's what I want for my life. I need the forgiveness of my sins. God, I'm sorry for what I've done and, 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 and I, I turn to you, I run to you, and I need the forgiveness. If that's you this morning, anywhere in this room, would you just raise your hand with every eye closed and just say, Austin, I want you to pray for me. I'm asking Jesus. Yes. 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 Is there anyone else? God, I, I thank you so much for these three hands, God. I pray, God, that you would minister, that you would allow them to not see the things that, that, that they've done in the past, but th that they would look to you, God, that they would see your holiness. God, I pray as they repent of their sins, which, which simply means that, that they're sorry, that they're turning from them. God, I, I pray that as, as, as they do that, that they would run towards you, Jesus, that they would leave the old life behind, God, that you'd give them the strength by your Holy Spirit to surround themselves with, with this beautiful team, God. Surround them with your, your loving arms. I just pray that the, the weight of sin would be lifted off their shoulders, that they would feel the forgiveness and the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And I just pray this morning that you would save them and you would place your spirit inside them and you would change them. In Jesus' name, continue with your eyes closed and heads bowed. I believe that there are many people here this morning that you realize that your selfish nature has crept in. Maybe it has something to do with the church or a department that you're in. Maybe it has something to do with work. Maybe it's in a relationship or marriage or, or maybe it's just you and you've just, God has exposed the selfish areas in your life and you're saying, man, I need, I need that to die this morning. Or maybe you need to commit to being all in. And you need to, to commit to being fully obedient and, and stop disobeying with your partial obedience. And, and you're saying this morning, you know, Pastor Austin, I, I, I realize God has spoken something to me. I've got some sanding and polishing. I love God with all of my heart, but I realize that there's some work to be done. And so this morning, I hear God, I respond to God. I'm going to ask him to help me in these areas that he's revealed to me. If that's you this morning, you just say, Austin, I just need help in some area of my life. Would you raise your hand this morning? I want to pray. Yes. Yes. So many. Yes. God, I pray for every hand. I pray that this just wouldn't be a moment that, that sticks for a moment, but it would be a moment that, that um, catapults us and launches us into action, God. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you, you would rid um, people of guilt of their past, God, and, and that from this day forward, we would be made new in you, God, that we'd be a new creation, that our coworkers would see a new me, that our spouses would see a new me, God. And I just pray that selfish nature would die in our hearts, God. I pray that we would be all in and be a team member, Jesus, and I thank you so much for that. And the last call is this, that, that you're here and you say, man, I, I am a team player. I am on this dream team. I'm all in. I feel like I'm there, and I'm just asking you, as you're saying, man, I'm, I'm on it. Like, I, I've been on it. I'm asking you to recommit, saying, until I take my last breath, I'm going to be on God's team. I'm, I'm going to do everything that I can. I'm going to look to the people to the left and to the right of me, and if they're struggling in their fundamentals, I'm going to mentor them. I'm going to disciple them. I'm going to, to, to understand that my time and my energy and my resources are meant for the greater good and not for myself, and I'm willing to commit myself to the greater good of this team, and that's you. Would you just raise your hand saying, yes, I'm going to continue. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. God, I, I thank you that we can gather in unity under your name. There's no other name than Jesus Christ that we can call on that brings unity and harmony. And, and I just pray, Jesus, that, that you would speak to our hearts this morning and you'd enable us to live what you've called us out to do. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Amen.